<laughs> One of the first things that, that happens during the day is the beef delivery. It gets broken down into various pieces and ends up in various dishes on the menu. Some serve that same day. You know, all the trim, the non-prime cuts get ground up for the burger. Some of it gets ground up for the bolognese, for the lasagna. The prime cuts get dry aged and then, you know, cut for steaks later on the night. This laid out from this end to this end is one side of beef, all from the same animal. It's 413 pounds hanging weight. So on the hoof, I think this was probably close to 1,000 pounds. And we process this much and sometimes a little bit more every week. This is our rib. We're gonna separate the rib eye for dry aging and leave the plate for the burger to supplement something a little bit fattier. The flavor is, you can't really compare, like having beef ground fresh in-house, what, every other day, sometimes daily. It is not uncommon for someone to come in at night and have a hamburger that started the day exactly like this. This is a 75-25 lean to fat blend of our grass-fed beef. We grind our beef on 1 8 one time for our burger. You know, this is not a particularly large batch. This is, a, this is five kilos. That'll yield us about 25 burgers, which is almost enough for a weeknight here at Rolos. All right, now we're gonna start portioning the burger. This is the Rolo's double cheeseburger. I think truly my favorite burger right now. Other people are doing great stuff, but the beef from these farms and the way that it's getting cooked upstairs is really exciting. We do 100 grams and we do two patties each. The cooks upstairs are of course not working on a flat top, they're working on a wood-fired grill. So they can't smash it upstairs. It has to come to them ready to go on the grill. We give them this portion pressed between two sheets so that they can pick it up easily, really nice and quick. We're about to take the uh, copa bacon out of the smoker. It's an important option on the burger. It doesn't always come on there, but another smoked and grilled component to the burger. The copa is the cluster of muscles in the shoulder that later on become the ribeye. The, the ratio of meat to fat is similar to bacon. So it's like very gently cooked, very low temperature smoke, and it like really reads in contrast to the smoke on the burger, which is that like delicious high intensity like char smoke from the wood fire. One of the components of the burger is grilled onions. So we make uh, garlic oil. It's actually really great for anything grilled. And then it can take like a real generous amount of salt. It'll all just become sweet and delicious after it's been in the oven. Our burger has lots of smoked and grilled components. We looked into like buying pickles and then we were like, you know, it would be really great if we had one big pepper. We slit it. If you don't give it a, a cut, they don't like sink when you pickle them, they just sort of like float. Then we'll toss it in like a, just a tiny slick of oil for that like smoke flavor to adhere. It doesn't really adhere well to like non-fatty things. And then we smoke it in there for, you know, it depends, about an hour. And then like pickle them right away. There they are. So Luis is taking the peppers and putting them in this container here. And he's gonna pour over hot pickling liquid, which is water, sugar, salt, and uh, rice wine vinegar. After they're pickled, it takes on all the acidity, salt, sugar, it makes it super tasty. And like a perfect contrast to the like fatty, juicy, hot burger. You have this cold, cooling, spicy, acidic pickle to eat with a burger. Ideally you're like burger, pepper, burger, pepper, burger, pepper. Here at Rolo's, we try to cook as much over the wood fire as possible. It really is our main source of cooking. The wood fire grill we have is made by JR at Gramercy Tavern where I used to work. They had a similar one with a sliding door. We made some modifications, dimension, old changes to make it a little more functional. Um, and then you can see just the wear and tear of the grill, like how much we use it and how hot it gets. This is like really high grade steel. The wear and tear of the grill sort of benefits us in a way where we can like lean a piece of steak up against this grate instead of having to use some other kind of tool to, to prop it up. 
whole animal butchery, it's, it's tough to make that kind of investment. Uh, you need space, you need the skilled labor. This morning, when it came in, I was just like, God. You know, I looked at the invoice, it's like, you know, $1,300. We have to sell all this. We have to turn all this into something that people want to buy and want to eat. We kind of just make an assessment, like, what is going to be suitable for dry aging on this animal? based sort of on where the cuts are. And we're gonna start breaking this animal by making a cut right here. We're gonna separate the rib eye for dry aging. We will be dry aging this rib eye later today. This decision is like how long the bone of the bone and rib eye will be. So we'll set this aside for dry aging. Right now, it's gonna live on this rack. This is gonna go into the walk-in. These are our dry aging cabinets. We just started dry aging ribeyes. We didn't like open Rolos with the idea of we're going to sell 32 ounce house dry aged ribeyes. Not once was that in the conversation. This was slaughtered a week ago. This was slaughtered seven or eight weeks ago. Broke it, same process as today. Nothing ever changes in that. Ideally, in a six week dry age like this, we're going to see 10% or less water loss. And that's mostly in this outer layer. You know, it's funny when you, you smell it, it doesn't smell like dry aged. I always compare it like Peter Luger's. I love Peter Luger's. It has sort of like a blue cheesy smell, but this dry age is very different. It doesn't have that real blue agey smell to it. It has more of like a salumi kind of prosciutto-y smell on the outside, you know? And part of the joy of dry aging is that we're given a more rich and diverse bouquet on the nose and a substantial increase in tenderness. All right, so I'm about to make spinach lasagna dough. So our tushi lasagna is probably the dish I'm most proud of. When you look at it, you see like a tushi lasagna and it's great, it's cool, it's different, it's unique, but uh, I see the whole team and multiple people doing their job correctly, which is really, really, really tough. It touches so many different hands. So the puree it goes in the bowl and I'm gonna add the flour and uh, knead the dough in the machine. So this is a mixture of double O flour and uh, double O de Molina. My part to play in the lasagna is the sauce bolognese. We start with beef that we take off the bone and turn it into kind of like a beef Italian sausage. There's pepper, there's nutmeg, there's garlic powder and onion powder, and there's salt. And all of those things get mixed together with the beef before we can grind it, sort of to like maximize absorption, and because the grinder is an exceedingly effective tool for integration of ingredients, there's nothing better in this kitchen at incorporating finely granulated ingredients across a large mixture. We keep this comparatively lean. A lot of traditional recipes call for 70-30 or a little bit more fat than that. This is a 75-25 blend. The next step in this process is to render this beef off and give it sort of like the maximum amount of Maillard reaction possible before adding it to the sauce. So we're just gonna roast this off. It takes about 20 minutes. And in that time, we're going to produce the sauce element of the bolognese. We're gonna cook off the sofrito base of the bolognese. I find that a food processor gives an inadequately even particle definition for the vegetable. I want it to be all the same size so it cooks the same way and you don't have any weird chunks. We're gonna accomplish that with the meat grinder. It's already out, we're already using it. When you give the problem to the butcher to the solve, the butcher solves it the butcher's way. So we're gonna cook this off in that rondeau when it comes up to temperature. This part is very, very traditional. It's all about moisture management, right? We were cooking out as much water as we can so that we get a nice, tight sauce that stays on the lasagna. About 15 to 20 minutes into the operation, uh, right now I'm adding tomato paste, um, and we're gonna cook this until it gets about fire engine red. We are going to deglaze with a little bit of white wine until it's reduced by half volume. This mixture of canned crushed tomatoes and cream are what get combined with the sofrito and the roasted ground beef to create like what becomes the sauce bolognese. This step is essential. Some version of this has to take place no matter what, when you're making a sauce that has like a ground element that you're trying to disperse throughout, whether you're doing it with a spoon 
in the pan as you're cooking it or doing something a little bit more protracted like this. If it's not evenly broken up, the meat is not a functional element of the sauce. After these ingredients are combined, I'm gonna cover the vessel with foil and we're gonna cook it in the combination oven for an hour and 30 minutes. The next component for the lasagna is bechamel. Uh, so milk and onions go on the stove. While that's working, I'm just gonna add a little bit of nutmeg. And then basically I'm waiting for the milk, onions, and nutmeg to come to a boil. We've already made a roux, so equal parts flour and butter, and cooled that down. And then I'm gonna add my very cold roux into that, wait for it to kind of come together and thicken, and then we'll pass it through a sieve so it's nice and fine and creamy, uh, get rid of the onions, and it's just the sauce that's like nice and thick. After making the dough, it sits overnight wrapped in plastic so that everything can get fully hydrated. It's a pretty tight dough, so it can be challenging to work with, but it produces a nice springy bite on the lasagna. This is Paola. Paola is one of the two PM prep cooks who focus mainly on, uh, on pasta production. Uh, it's intense. Look at her go. It's my santé fino para poner el maquino todavía no. She's sweating. ¿Quieres que te ayude por un momento? Okay. Yeah, man, it is intense though. It doesn't, doesn't have a lot of give. So Paula had to form the pasta dough just to get it into the machine. She's gonna fold it over, or what we call laminate it a few times. That's fold it over, work it a little bit, and then uh, she'll also be able to, to adjust its width so it fits right in and is pressed out the exact width of the mouth of the machine, which we have measured for our lasagna. So she only has to do vertical cuts every six inches. So we have our blanched lasagna sheets, bolognese, parmesan, and bechamel. We'll just start filling each lasagna, and then they end up making their way into these hotel pans for service. You know, there's like an infinite amount of things that can go wrong in the process. And then during service, it has to get fired in the wood fire oven. If the oven is too hot, no good. If it's not hot enough, no good. So many things can go wrong and so many different people like touch it that like at the end of the day like I look on the past and I see like a perfect one I'm just like we did it. So this is the same rib that we took out of the dry agent this morning. I've removed a piece of the spine that we call the chine. So we're just going to remove this end cap and kind of see what we're working with. We're gonna remove a little bit more, but yeah, I think that's beautiful. It's very dense. You can see it's kind of still purple. Beautiful. We should be able to get eight portions out of this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Great. We're gonna mark right here. This one will be a little heavy, but I have a bit of fat to remove here before we get down to like an appropriate portion. You know, polite steak for thoughtful people. All right. I'm, I think that's beautiful. I really can't imagine a more beautiful steak. Yep, that is a 36 ounce steak, and once we have that Frenched up, it's gonna be exactly where we want it. And then when this goes upstairs, they'll temper it, turn it into something beautiful. The way we grill the proteins, like particularly the steaks, perfect grill marks is not the goal. Even browning, even grilling is the goal. You'll see me move it around all the time. It has so much time on the grill, you can just keep moving it and moving it and moving it. Every time you move it, some part that didn't get browned or caramelized, a mired reaction gets that. You know, we want it to be that brown everywhere. We use an herb brush I am about to make right now. So this is a stalk of lemongrass. It, like all the fat from the base, the herbs hit the hot grill and just add more delicious flavor. This is Jackie. She's gonna show us how to make the polenta bread. We start with warm water, 90 degrees, olive oil, and bread flour. So this first step is just the auto-leasing. We're just combining the water, olive oil, flour, and then letting it sit. 
just to fully hydrate the flour. And after like 30 minutes, we'll add the yeast, sea salt, and the soaked polenta. And then it'll have its final mix. And then we'll go through the whole process of like folding it and letting it rise completely for four to five hours and then dividing. Something about hot bread is just, it's just irresistible, you know? And we always thought of like how cool would it be to just like slide something out directly out of the wood fire oven onto a plate and then like go directly to a table within like 30 seconds. The polenta gives it like a buttery popcorn flavor and the inside becomes like custardy and tender and not like overly chewy, um, which is sort of like just like perfect for something like this. You know, the wood adds this complexity. There's just no way to mimic that real big piece of wood, burned down to embers, the moisture and fat dripping on that, creating smoke, you just can't compare. And then when you combine it with really great beef that we dry age ourselves and then grilled, yeah, it's really good.